Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Bnei Amaydan Suryo Yishlom Alekhun. Bnei Amman Atura Yishlom Alekhun. This, uh, in this uh, first panel of uh, Saturday, uh, it's devoted uh, to linguistic rights and uh, two of the three spe speakers will insist on the linguistic right and the first uh, it's about the the german orphanage in uh, urmia dilgusha uh, which was founded by uh, the german uh, orient uh, uh, johannes lipsius uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Martin Tamke, who is theologian and orientalist from the University of uh, Göttingen. The title of his speech is uh, The End of the Syriac Orphanage in Dilgusha, Urmia. M Mr. Tamke, I give you with pleasure the floor. You have uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. As older you get, you have problems with eyes and other things. <laughs> um, in the year 1915, appeared a letter in the magazine Der Christliche Orient, in English it would be the Christian Orient, that was written by an orphan girl from the orphanage in the German mission of the Orient in Dilgusha, near Urmia, to the German directress of the orphanage. After she was forced by the Persian authorities, because of Russian pressure, to leave the country. I quote, Beloved mother, Many, many love from your daughter, Sulte. I have been so happy to hear from you that I have immediately brought the letter to Mrs. P.F., that's Mrs. Pflaume, an American uh, lady married with a Lutheran American missionary in that region, so she thought could translate it for me. How happy I am that you are feeling good. Daily I pray that God may keep you safe and bless you. You have always been a mother to me and your girls. I always think of our good home. I am so sad. Right now, the military is in our house. After you have been gone for two months, the Kurds came. The bad Mohammedans from the town and the Kurds have destroyed your house all our houses, and the church, and the garden. In that time, the Kurds have arrested and killed many. Many people flee to the missions. We had many diseases, first measles, then typhus. That was a horrible time for Christians. That was endless work for the American missionaries, lots of work and effort. During those six months, the missionaries gave bread to the Syrians, daily. And Dr. P, that's Dr. Peckert, and the other doctors treated the diseases without money. The shortage of the names is because of the uh, censorship uh, of the letters in the World War. She then lists all of those children of the house that have died who are all buried in the garden of the German mission. Oh, my beloved mother, I don't want to tell you too much about our house. It would only hurt you. End of quotation. The letter gives an insight about the history of the orphanage in the year of 1915. From the perspective of an adolescent girl, to say it more precisely, this is a report written in childish diction about the Seifu, 
with reference to the microcosm, which was the child's life. That the girl might possibly have had help writing the letter doesn't make its value as an eyewitness report any smaller. Especially not since it should not be possible to falsify or verify such a thesis, for there is no comparable source material transmitted. Indeed, there has always been the convention that reports of every single orphan child were sent to Germany, in which a short biography of the child was given as well as the children were asked to write letters of appreciation to their godparents, which became vivid by the children's description of situations of their daily lives. The godparents should have the possibility to participate in the children's lives and their progress in the orphanage. Likewise, it should ensure that the godparents would willingly continue to donate money for the preservation of the child in the orphanage. The orphanage of Indelgusha was the largest initiative of the German mission of the Orient within the context of the Syrian-speaking Christianity. At the most important mission of the German mission for the Orient or of the Orient in the Ottoman Urfa with a hospital, a school and a carpet factory, Syrians were mostly noticed as patients of the hospital. Above that, the staff of the mission were taking care of the redevelopment of the Syrian school system in Urfa and were raising the money to establish Syrian schools. In Diyarbakir, the missionary work was suffering under the restrictions of the authorities and the environment and was finally, after the official ending of their work, only working to a small amount conspiratively. The last two children were brought by Dietwig von Erzen in 1917 to Mardin to the relatives of them. Von Erzen was at that time the director of the soldiers' home of the German soldiers in Mardin. This way, he freed them from the unbearable situation in their hiding place. They were complete orphans. Their families have perished. In principle, Armenian children were accommodated in the orphanage as well as in the orphanage in Khoi in the Iranian Azerbaijan. Whereas the orphanage in Dilgusha was designed from the beginning on to accommodate Syrian orphans and took, until its decay in the Seifo, only Syrian children. In January 1898, already 60 orphans have been assigned to the house. The leader of the mission was not a German, but a Syrian. He was as well the supervisor of the German employee Margrethe Paulat. The Syrian David Ismail Khan is explicitly mentioned by Johannes Lepsius as our friend. Again, the head of the mission emphasizes that in this house only Syrian children are accommodated. Still, it is a small house, I quote. Since the houses there are too small, temporarily only 30 children can be taken care of inside the house. Others will be taken care of outside the house, as far as the financial situation allows it. A detailed travel report by Margarita Paulat took the reader into the regional and cultural characteristics. Already in June 1898, it is mentioned clearly that it was a house only for girls. At that time, there were already 70 orphans in the custody of the mission, and next to a German pastor, von Bergemann, and David Ismael, who was still working there, and Margarete Paulat, was also the Kasha Abraham involved in the work. The work was hard. The children were suffering fevers and headaches. The bad water was the cause which led to the fact that the water was only served boiled. 
When a doctor came to the mission, she was mainly treating eye diseases. This should be helped by relocation to a village in the mountains to a summer house over the summer months. Not before the summer of 1898, the summer residence of the Earl Medjid Sultana could be bought together with its magnificent garden. About the orphan children is told that they came, I quote, came with the refugees from the Kurdish mountains over the Persian border, end of quotation. So these orphans are not coming by the background of the Urmia region, they are coming from Hakkari. In May 1899, a great famine in Urmia threatened the missionaries. When Johannes Lepsius visited the orphanage in July 1899, there were 80 orphans in the house. The history of the orphanage is at this time the topic to one of the dissertations I am supervising that includes the orphanage in Koi as well. Therefore, sorry, I am skipping the varied history from 1897 8 to 1915 to concentrate on the last weeks of the house. After the war has started in 1914, the situation of the mission was changing dramatically depending on the military situation. Our orphanage is avoided, the supervisor Anna Friedemann reported in the fall. I quote, even our friends, the Syrians, whose children we educate, wouldn't dare to enter the house. But the situation seemed to change. The refugees were rushing into the city. The city was full of them. Now the German mission became the destination to frightened refugees. Married daughters, girls that have uh, formerly lived in the house, rescued themselves with their families into the orphanage. War-related events become the daily scenery of the city's life. At night and at day, I quote, rumble of gunfire comes to our house, end of quotation. On October 26, a planned massacre among Christians was foiled by approaching Russian troops. But the penalties of the Russian troops enraged the Muslim population. A large number of Muslims were hung, among them a leading person. In the mission, they were preparing for a violent ending. I quote, we were facing our destruction impotent, with dry eyes but brave after so much pain. After repeated changeover, the higher, Anna Friedemann talks of better, Syrian families flee to the orphanage. As soon as they arrived at the house of the mission, Anna Friedemann received at the 3rd of November the order to vacate the institution the same day. The young officer of the Persians referred to the fact that the Iranians were unable of action. It was the Russians who demanded the expulsion of the German. Now a severe struggle began. Anna Friedemann refused to leave the mission. Finally, she, should, she could obtain a delay of two days. Those were enough to provide for the children. Guy Varghese, who was very dear to her, she gave to the American Lutheran missionary couple Pflaumer. Soon he heavily came down with typhus there. The ep epidemic spread quickly in the city, especially among the children of the orphanage. Anna Friedemann mentioned in one of her reports, I quote, at the missionaries, 4,100 died because of typhus. But Guy Verghese recovered. The young teacher, Maria Lazar, was brought from her into contact with the Americans. Then she was teaching at the American house, Lutheran American house. Even though there was no permanent solution for most of the children, Anna Friedemann could well accommodate four children. The Americans took charge of the inventory. 
The close cooperation with the Lutheran Americans became visible to the outside when they accompanied the withdrawing German population of the city, among them the German staff of the mission, until they reached the gates of the city. Sultan uh, Tamris, who had written the letter, quoted in the beginning to Anna Friedemann right out of the Seifo, could put the German supervisor of the orphanage in contact with the American friends, so she could work there as a housemaid. She was preparing there for her examination as a teacher. She came to the house of the German Orient Mission as a complete orphan. She had no other home than this house. She was skilled with the housework, so she could become a major help to, of Anna Friedemann to finish the daily work. The letter reached Friedemann only after futile tries of her to get in contact with the children. Other correspondences functioned over the relatives in the German-American missions in Mahabad and Urmia, as well as over the Hermannsburg mission and the priest in Urmia, in the Urmia region, who worked for them. Again and again, she reported cruel details from these letters at the organs of publications of the mission. To these also belonged the transfer of the report of Mrs. Pflaumer, the wife of the American German Lutheran, to whom she gave the little Givergis, who was an exception in the orphanage because he was taken to the girl's home even though he was a boy. The German-American pastor Flaumer himself became a victim in later wave of violence. His widow reports in a journal of the mission. I quote, On the 30th and 31th of July left the Christians Urmia. A couple of hours later the Kurds and Turks have already arrived to town. We stayed in our house since we were not engaged into politics. We didn't think of danger. We were undisturbed until two in the afternoon when someone knocked at the gate. Outside were Turkish soldiers who wanted to come in. Within a couple of minutes, the yard was full with soldiers, Kurds and Turks. Within three to four hours, we were beggars without home, clothing, and beds. She tells that they then went to a house that was rented for the institution and goes on. Some Kurds and a Turkish sergeant followed us and requested money. We had no more money. The sergeant sent for one of the Kurds and let him abuse my husband. He was given a whipping beaten and kicked with heavy boots. Finally, he shot my husband in front of my. He was dead immediately. The shot went right through his head. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Professor Tomke. Uh, it was it was really a pleasure to listen to your speech uh, because I in listening to you I I had in mind that uh, the the role of Germany doesn't confine only to a political alliance between Germany at being and the Ottoman Empire, but uh, it is uh, extended to a very important uh, humanitarian uh, a place taken by German missionaries with uh, at the head of this uh, mission, uh, Johannes Lepsius. And uh, I remember the book of uh, uh, of uh, Abraham Yohannan, who was professor, an Assyrian from Urmia, who was a professor at Columbia University. He published a book in uh, 1918, 
entitled The Death of a Nation. In this book, he mentioned greatly the role played by the German missionaries in Urmia, and thank you very much. Uh, now, the, the following speakers are, are they, they, they will insist on the linguistic aspect of uh, genocide and the role uh, played by, by Syriacs uh, in testimony about the genocide and the Syriac uh, literature. Uh, I have in mind the two, uh, two quotation of uh, Paul Bejan and uh, Naum Faik. Paul Bejan said, uh, he was from Salamas near uh, Urmia. And Naum Faik, man dlo yoda li shone, lo yoda mono it iled. The first speaker is Professor uh, Sebastian Bednarovic, who is uh, from, excuse my pronunciation, uh, from Bidgochk uh, University in Poland at the Institute of uh, Neophilology. The title of his speech is Before and Under Linguicide, uh, Linguicide, a Linguistic Aspect of the Seifo. Uh, Mr. Sebastian, I give you the floor. Uh, at first, I would like to express my deep gratitude towards the, all uh, those who um, were engaged in organizing this uh, conference and enabling me to participate in this feast, in this celebration of memory of the Assyrian nation. Uh, the main purpose of my paper is another aspect of the genocide, namely its impact on the language diversity. So it will be about death of languages. Um, although predicting future of a language is a very difficult thing, there are some indicators enabling to foretell if a language has chance to survive in long or short time, uh, short term, or its existence in a given environment will be ceased. The history knows fates of great and widespread tongues, which after the era of blossom entered the period of decline and eventually went out of use. Sumerian, Akkadian, to name a few. Its death were caused by lack of former power and prestige in the face of other languages which have been starting to overtake hegemony in the cultural and political life of societies. Regarding these facts, scholars have observed many factors which are known to influence on the language laws. Languages are often compared to or compared with species of plants um, or animals, and they can survive if they will have come out conditions. But in other case, and without a convenient protection, they are endangered by extinction. So regarding these facts, scholars have observed many factors um, which are known to influence on the language loss. And languages, as I have said, are often compared with species of plants and animals. And, uh, uh, as far as the languages are concerned, three different types of language uh, death are usually indicated. The first one is a shift, uh, being an effect of the organic development of a language, then a shift from one language to the other as a result of sociolinguistic processes, and lastly, a death of language in the consequence of physical extinction of population, it can be tribe, it can be even <laughs> the whole nation, etc. The first type of language death, so, uh, so a shift being an effect of, uh, of, an, um, of the organic development of language, is uh, considered to be the most natural way of termination of language life. Despite the Latin, Byzantine, Greek, uh, or Middle German went out of common use, 
they gave life to other languages, Romance languages, modern Greek or modern German, and in such manner they remained alive. The first, um, the, the more, con more controversial assessing um, is assessing the shift from one language to uh, another, so the second type of language death. And this type of language death has attracted attendance of scholars for many years. The decision of adult persons to abandon their mother tongue and to start speaking another language and also to teach it uh, their children uh, can have various reasons. It can be caused by the low status of, um, of a language in contrast to the wide use of another, which is the main mean of communication in, the, in domains that tend to be considered prestigious, for instance. Moreover, this shift often rooted in overt or covert persecution uh, of a linguistic group, usually being also a minority, this group, within a given society. The language is then banned from use in public and its speakers are subjugated to a variety of punishment. This case took place, for instance, in the Britain, in, in the Great Britain in the 19th century, where the Welsh speaking, well, 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 the, well the Welsh children speaking Welsh uh, in school, or at schools, were castigated with a flogging. Uh, language shift together with language loss being um, its last stage is preceded by period of language endangerment that increases when the language loses subsequent domains its, of its use. According to Wurm, we can distinguish five different degrees of such endangerment and classify languages, and he, um, so, so Wurm, classifies the languages um, as follows. So they are potential endangered, which usually implies, so, so the languages that um, uh, um, suffer from lack of, a, of prestige in, in the home country. Uh, and um, the second group are uh, the endangered lang languages where the youngest fluent speakers tend to be um, the young adults and um, there, um, there is a the, the distinction uh, in passing on uh, the languages to children, then seriously or severally endangered. Uh, there is only one generation, the very, usually very, very aged, uh, who um, know uh, this language, and uh, and the moribund, and at the end moribund, so at the age of extinction and extinct. Uh, the last type of language death appears rather rare and is triggered through natural catastrophes, uh, so the physical extinction of, of, this, of the total population, speaking a language, is um, ra rather rare and um, is triggered, is caused through a natural catastrophe, for instance, earthquake, tsunami, disease, famine, or happens in consequence of wars and genocides. The natural factors, of course, can also coincide with language shift, which has been already in process within a society and make the language uh, endangerment more uh, severe. For assessing the language vitality, which is something um, opposed, uh, the opposite side of um, language uh, endangerment, uh, the UNESCO has prepared a scale of, um, of this language vitality. So we can say nine, at first there was eight points, eight um, stages of, uh, or eight factors um, uh, which enable the language transmission. The first, of course, the most important is the intergenerational uh, language transmission, without this, no, no language can um, survive. Then absolute number of speakers. However, it's not the main factor. It's the most important factor. The most, most important or more important is who speak 
this language and uh, for what purpose and why so, so why, why he speak, um, he speak this um, language then the proportion of speakers within the total population loss of existing language domains response to new domains and media material for language education and literacy governmental and institutional language attitudes and policies and polishes including official language status and use, uh, community members' attitudes towards their own language. It's also very important to maintain uh, language alive. And um, the ninth um, factor was uh, added uh, to this uh, uh, to the set of, of factors. Uh, it's, um, it's amount and quality of documentation, the documentation about the languages. Uh, it, it is uh, especially uh, important, especially uh, it's very important in, in case of languages without um, uh, literature, without the, the spoken languages that, are, that have no written form. Uh, after this, so this short introduction, I want uh, to present the term linguicide as being crucial for further considerations. The word linguicide was coined uh, at the same way as the genocide or ethnocide, so side is a um, Latin root for a killing. And for the first time, it was used for, by uh, the Finnish Toves Kudnap Kangas to describe the linguistic genocide. So the, li um, the linguicide is the same as the linguistic genocide. Um, and according to uh, Skudnap Kangas, a linguicide is, represents actively killing a language without killing the speakers, as in a physical genocide, or through passivity. So letting a language die without any support, for instance. Uh, and basing on this definition, I will uh, carry out, carry on my presentation. The term language, um, linguicide or genocide of, of language and the uh, interest uh, in the preserving the language diversity of the world uh, caused that many uh, scholars, especially the linguists, uh, tried to, uh, to work a frameworks that enable to um, preserve the language diversity and uh, to, to, to protect languages from um, extinction. Uh, one of these documents, one of the documents that were uh, signed um, at um, UNESCO is the Universal Declaration uh, on Linguistic Rights. It was signed on the conf World Conference on Linguistic Rights in Barcelona in Spain in 1996. Uh, 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 and here we can find uh, Three, so in the, in the preamble, in the introduction to this, in this, this document, we can find uh, an enlistment of the rights that every language has. Uh, so the right for the own, so, and not the language has, uh, sorry, but the speakers of the language, of course, um, have. So the right for, um, so everyone, every, every human people, every human being has has right to, for their own language and culture to be taught, the right to access to cultural services, the right to an equitable presence of the of the language and culture uh, and culture in the communication and media, and the right to receive attention in their own language from government bodies and in socio-economic relations. 
Uh, of course, it's not the, it, is, it is not the only document concerning the uh, linguistic human rights. Um, for instance, uh, this topic is very popular and very um, good uh, perceived in the uh, <laughs> European Union. We have the Bureau of the uh, Lesser Used Languages, which is concerns of this bureau is to protect the small languages of and the lesser used languages of um, euro and uh, in today's europe uh, the protection of languages is is, is very um, developed but now let's go to the time of cipher this is the map of the ethnic the ethnic groups that lived in Turkey, at the territory of today's Turkey, before the First World War. So we can see that the map is different from the map we can see now, especially in the Western provinces, we see this blue color, there are Armenians. So a great, so the, the, um, the Eastern provinces of today's Turkey, well, almost, uh, populated almost um, wholly by Armenians, and in the fact, um, this um, group was the most uh, populous among the minorities of the uh, of the um, Ottoman uh, Empire. Uh, today, I want to say about three uh, three groups, uh, not only about the, of course, about uh, the Armenians, but first of all about um, the Assyrians or uh, Syriacs, but of course the Armenians were the most populous and uh, the largest group of uh, Turkey, so that is why uh, they also deserve special consideration. In 1968, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, lived about three million of Armenians, so uh, as it was attested at the conference in Berlin, and uh, especially in the in the eastern provinces, of course, of um, the mm. yeah, Ottoman Empire, at uh, for instance uh, in Erzurum, Van, Mush, and also Trabzon, and this, uh, especially in the in, in the province of in, in the historical uh, region of the Greater uh, Armenia. Uh, but which languages were spoken by Armenians? We are uh, talking about the uh, language rights. So which languages were spoken by Armenians? Armenians? Firstly, two Armenian languages, the Western Armenian and the Eastern Armenian, the languages that are different. And uh, uh, it is estimated that before the First World War, the Ottoman Empire existed more than 50 uh, spoken varieties of Armenian, so 50, more than 50 dialects of, of the spoken Armenian. Nevertheless, we must also take into consideration that at least for a part of Armenians, especially those living in Constantinople and cities of, oh, of the western part of country, uh, Turkish was their first, their, their mother tongue. The second group, of course, were Assyrians, Unfortunately, they were not uh, situated on this map. This map uh, was uh, taken from the uh, German uh, school atlas before, I think, 1909, I think. This is just about. Uh, but according to some um, data and uh, memoirs and uh, reports of, um, of travelers, we can estimated number of uh, Syriacs, I, th I mean here the followers of the uh, Syriac Orthodox uh, Church, as about 30,000 in the region of Turabdin. Of course, they live also um, in another places uh, too. Uh, in Hakkari lived Assyrians, as we, uh, as we know from um, the um, presentation that were, uh, for instance, um, 
yesterday. And in the north, in the northern part, lived Greeks. And northern and even in the Aegean uh, shore. Uh, the, the Armenia, the Greeks, uh, of course, spoke um, uh, different Greek varieties: the Pontic Greeks, uh, the Pontic Greek, and uh, also the Greek from um, so the, the insular Greek. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was a complex and multi-ethnic and multicultural construction, and Christian denomination, like other religious communities, were organized in a system of millets with patriarchs being its chiefs and having broad autonomy uh, concerning not only religious uh, affairs, but also jurisdiction and tax collecting. And this is a table that uh, presents us how the, um, the changes in proportion of Muslim and non-Muslim population in Turkey after the First World War. So we see the decline, the decline in percentage. Of course, we must remember that uh, before the First World War, uh, Turkey was larger. Uh, there was also villages from uh, so Ottoman Empire was not only two days Turkey. This two days, two days uh, Turkey was uh, the, the borders were established um, at the uh, conference uh, at, uh, um, according to the. Street of uh, of Lausanne, uh, but we, ha we can see here the changes in Muslim population. Okay. The other factors uh, of language loss in Turkey. So uh, after the Sefer, of course, the first, the most important, the dispersion of language communities due to massive migration of Greeks, Armenians, and Assyrians, Syriacs. The Islamization and Turkification, or Kurdification. Of Christian women and children, uh, of course, they were cut off of the families and the languages uh, they were uh, spoken before um, ceased. And the, the, the third factor, pan-Turkic pan ideology of being fundament, uh, which was um, the fundament of the Turkish Republic. So this is the constitution of Republic of Turkey. You can see the articles, the state of Turkey, which. Um, I think the most uh, important here is Article 22. This, it is the current uh, constitution of Turkey Republic. No language other than Turkish shall be taught as a mother tongue to Turkish citizens at any institution of education. And Article 66, every ba everyone bound to the Turkish state through the bond of citi citize citizenship is a Turk. So. Um, after the Seifo, after the uh, Turkish Republic was established, also the pan-Turkic ideology was the main and the most important uh, way of, of, of thinking in uh, language policy. So thank you for your presentation. I short it in some. Thank you, uh, Professor Betnarovic. You, you, you have raised many important questions uh, about, uh, a, you gave a typology of uh, endangered languages uh, in the world, a, an important definition of uh, linguicide, which is one of the aspect of uh, ethnocide, and uh, you insisted to on the declaration of UNESCO about the, uh, UNESCO is uh, making an important work uh, on the subject. And you, you finished by giving a, a, a summary of the situation of minorities in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, uh, and between them, uh, Syriac and Armenia. Now I am giving the floor to, to Professor uh, Simon Bir. <laughs> to Professor uh, Simon Birol, who is, uh, who is professor at, uh, 
you are a specialist on old church history at the University of Bochum. Uh, your speech uh, will be about the experience of the Saifo in the Syriac uh, literature, a first approach. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, for the explanation and interpretation of persecutions and defeats, all the great religions have their own scriptural resources to which they can refer. Because of the fact that Syria Christians have a long experience of facing encroachments and massacres, it is not surprising that the writers from different epochs established a rich literature of work dealing with these topics. In this presentation, I will give a few examples of what kind of information we can find about Seifu in the Syriac Orthodox manuscript, manuscripts of Torah Abdin. Moreover, I will try to identify the scriptural resources Syriacs from Torah Abdin had used and how they used traditional elements of the Syriac literature to deal with such horrific experiences. One of the oldest remarks about the Seifu in the Syriac Orthodox manuscripts of Torah Abdin had been written by a person who has been famous for writing and compiling ancient Syriac manuscripts in Mardin. His students, though, would say that he neither said nor written a single word about the Seifu. It is Bishop Philoxenus Johannan Dolabani from Mardin. Dolabani was born in 1884, 85 in Mardin. His formal religious education began at the school of of the Capuchin Fathers in Mardin. In 1908, at the age of 22, Dolabani was made a novice. He spent the initial stage of his ascetic life, five years, at the monastery of Our Lady situated in the cliffs about Deir Zafaran. In 1913, he became a teacher in the seminary of this monastery. After the Sefo, he was ordained priest by Patriarch Mor Ignatius Elias III in 1918, and from 1947 to 1969, he was instead as the Metropolitan Bishop of Mardin. As earlier mentioned, there is no book or article written by him that is about the Seifu, though not every writing of him has been studied in detail. But we can see how he used to deal with the happenings of his time. If we look at the copies or newly compilated manuscripts in Mardin in the years 1915 and 1916, ZFRN is the abbreviation for Del Zafran, and CFMM is an acronym for the Church of the Forty Martyrs in Mardin. <coughs> we find these ones. In 1915, Zafran 232 uh, by an anonymous writer. It contains a Garshuni version of John Climacus, The Book of the Letter. Zephyrin 40 and CFMM 144, both copied by Dolabani. In 1916, CFMM 267, hagiographical literature, mostly martyrs, copied by Dolabani. Zephyrin 386, questions and answers in Arabic. The scriber was Jibrail ibn Ilyas of Mosul. All in all, we find three manuscripts in these years, which were compiled by Dolabani. The manuscripts from 1915, Zephyrin 40 and CFMM 144, have the same content with the same pagination as you can see behind me. Content and pagination, it's the same, except these additional writings at the end of CFMM 144. At first, we find memory of different topics from different authors who have lived in different epochs. For instance, Barqiqi from, e from 11th century, Yaqub Urnsoyo from 18th century, or Behanam Hadloyo from 15th century. At the first glance, any structure of these writings cannot be detected. The common characteristic of all the writings is that both manuscripts contained only memory poems with a fixed number of syllable couplets. 
but Dolabani noted at the beginning of both manuscripts that he left out the writings of famous church, church fathers like Ephraim or Jacob of Zeruk, and instead of them, he has put others intentionally in these manuscripts. In this conglomeration, it is striking that in the first part of the manuscript, several poems which are lamenting about human finiteness, peccability, and about the experience of catastrophes can be detected. Some of them are explicit about seifu like events, for instance, Yeshu Bar Khairun's On the Destruction of Mardin in 1333, or the poems of Ishayu Bar Denho's Biri Noyo. But also the poems about the pickability and finiteness can be interpreted in the same sense, because Syriac authors have used varying degrees of moral theological thinking to seek a way to explain horrific events. It is obvious that Dolabani was seeking a comprehension for the present by consulting the former Syriac writings. He did not only copy, copy their writings, but also reflected on them. This can be seen very clear by his notes at the end of some of the poems. His longest and most important most important rima can be found after the end of Jakub Nusoyo's second poem on the vast of the end and on death. The author Bishop Gorilos Jakub Ornusoyo Beth Mirijan was born in Urnus, a village in Turabdin. He became the Bishop of Midyat in 1778 and wrote 11 poems about biblical figures, human peccability, and also about the end of the world. He died in 1804. In his mentioned poem, On the Wars of the End on, and on Death, he draws an apocalyptic <laughs> image of the end of the world, in which one can summarize its content by quoting these two stanzas from it. O Habibai, O Beloved, at the end of the Muslim kingdom, wars at al borders of the Muslim will be multiplied, and the men will be done fornication like the people of Sodom. The world will be trembled and shaken and also frightened, and they will open their mouth like beasts and rear up at the Syriacs. They persecute them from town to town as if they were strangers, weighed down by the sins of the church's people and the solitary monks, because they have not obeyed the Lord's commandments. Especially the last quoted words became very popular in the period after the Seifu. Many older people learned these words by heart, and also young people grew up with these words. A testimony of this can be seen in Helmut Ritter's book, Puroyo. The only verses in classical Syriac, the so-called Xobonoyo, were quoted from a young boy of 11 years old who sang these verses. So this work was well known in Turabdin also in the 60s and in the 70s. At the end of this poem, Dolabani gave this statement. First he wrote, these two poems of Moria Kupernusoyo were copied by Yohan, a monk from Mardin, and son of the priest Yosef Dolabani. At the end of his remark, he wrote from here, from Kethet Enu. I have written them, and especially the last one, because his prophecy has been fulfilled in our time. Behold how horrible, how tottering his image was. It has been fulfilled on the Syriacs. And they didn't remain, or nothing remained, except the small numbers of fugitives. This statement gives us the, gives us the opportunity to see the high influence this poem had on Dolabani. We can understand why he did not write anything else later except this small note about the Seifu. Everything important has been said more than 100 years ago by this prophecy. If we follow the definition of historical thinking by Jörn Rüsen, we can see how the interpretation of the past led to a comprehension for the present and expectations to the future. In this case, the, these expectations seem to be as negative as the safe itself was for Dolabani. Besides, we find three other manuscripts from this poem of Bishop Jacob Ornusoyo, also in Torah Abdin, 
two manuscripts are preserved in Deir Zafaran, and the other one can be found at the monastery of Mor Gabriel. In this case, it is striking that these manuscripts were compiled and comp copied in 1971 or 1972 in the face of the Cyprus crisis and the political instability of Turkey, which affected the Christian in a way that most of the eyewitnesses who are still alive recount that they have feared a recurrence of the Seifu in this time. So this poem of Jacob Ornusoyo seems to be one of the most famous scriptural resources to which Syriacs have referred in such situations. The expression of the Seifu by rereading former writings and contextualizing his own experiences, experience in these writings is a method which can be seen in the anthologies of the Seifu published by the late Archbishop Julius Yeshor Cicek, a former student of Dolabani at Deir Zafran. He published two poems about the Seifu, putting, putting writings about horrific experiences before and also after it. In comparison with the mentioned manuscript, you can detect that all Johann Zbirinoyo's poem, Jbitho, Captivity. Also in his second anthology, Tenhawtha the Turadin, or Grounds of Turadin, published 1987, Bishop Cicek had, has used the same method. And we can also identify poems he edited, which has been part of the mentioned manuscripts. Therefore, we can find Jakub Anusoyo's poem also, though his text is dealing about human finiteness and peccability and not about a specific Sefo-like event. It seems to be clear that Cicek and other readers interpreted this poem close to Dolabani's view. <coughs> Another poem which has been used as scriptural resource for Syriacs and has been recited by Syriacs after the Sefo is the Mimro or the poem of Bishop Gewargis of Beth Zabdai about the massacres, massacre of Azakh by Muhammad Pasha of Rwandas in 1834. Fourteen years later, this bishop became martyred by the Kurdish clan chief Bedir Khan. This poem has been published in Bishop Cicek's first anthology and was still recited by the people of Bissorino. This little information can be taken from a note from manuscript CFMM 280, which has been compiled in 19. 45 by an anonymous person from Bessorino. The connection between the experience of Bishop Gewargis and the Seifo can be seen by Sleman Henno's book Gunhit Suryoye, because Henno has recited this poem besides other memories several times at the beginning of his work. Nevertheless, Henno and also Karabashi differ from this tradition, which can be seen Firstly, in the style, they did not use a poetic form to write and memorize about the Seifo, but a prosaic style. In the case of Henno, it seems clear that his aim was not to express his own experience to the Seifo. Henno was born in 1918, but thus after the Seifo, but to record the information he took up by asking eyewitnesses about the Seifo. By quoting several stanzas from the memory of Galushabu and Monk Yuhan from Kafro about the Seifo and other authors lamenting about Seifo like catastrophes and human finiteness, Henno was able to contextualize his prosaic text in this tradition. In, in contrast, Karabashi did not use these scriptural resources in a direct way, but he integrated the Seifo in the history of Christian persecutions. Therefore, he begins his book by putting anti-Christian -anti policies of the 10 Roman emperors from Nero to Galerius in front of his reports about the Seifo. With the book of Karabashi and Hanu, the way of dealing with the Seifo has changed. Whereas the first author of poems about the Seifo, especially Galoshabu, wrote to explain and interpret the Seifo and to break the unutterable shock of the Seifo, Karabashi and Henno, who wrote their books a few years, or in the case of Henno, some decades later than the poets, recorded the Seifo to remember and contextualize it in the history of their people. 
I conclude this presentation by giving a different kind of information we can find in the Syriac manuscript tradition from Tur Abdi. An interesting remark about the Sefo can be seen in the manuscript 279 of the monastery of Mor Gabriel. It is a lectionary, maybe written in the 17th or 18th century, and Garshuni, so the unnamed author used Syriac letters for writing in Arabic language. And the colophon at the end of this manuscript, Marke Barhuroyo Gaurie from Midyat, who repaired this manuscript in 1948, wrote about it in classical Syriac. This book of the Old Testament suffered at first from the year 2226 of the Greeks, also 1914 or 1915 AD, from the terrible year of the slaughter and sword. He uses the terms harbo and seifu which fell about the Christians when all the economy of the churches and of the Christians and also the books fell in the hands, hands of the pagans, he means Muslims. From them they burned, destroyed, and some of them were sold for a little price. Also, this manuscript came into the hands of persons of Midyat, respectively the deputy of the church of Morbarsamo, his name is Morbasom, his name is Gorgis or Giorgio Haidari and his friends. And after a while, it has been brought to Medan or respectively to the church of Moriakub, the teacher. All in all, the manuscripts from Torah Din witness the slow process of finding an educate form of expression of the Seifu. Also, we have seen how important the scriptural sources were for, first, were for the first generation to get over the traumatic experiences of the Seifu. Though Seifu has meant a serious, break, serious break, break in the history of Syriacs, and only few writings were handed down from the eyewitnesses of the Seifu, it is possible to reconstruct the first reaction of some Syriac writers after the Seifu, and to collect different important information from the manuscript tradition of Torah Din. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, really, for your speech. Uh, in fact, it is of primary importance uh, to, to focus on the Syriac literature dealing with the genocide. And uh, it is time. Uh, it, it, and it is time to include them in uh, our bibliography uh, concerning genocide. I, while listening to you, I have in my hand many, many documents. I would like to mention one, one of them, more uh, Afrem Barsoum, in his book, al uh, al Mansur Fi Tariq Al-Adab al Syrianiya, he, he mentioned many of uh, the manuscript, uh, you, uh, you spoke about them in your... Uh, okay, th thank you. N now you have the floor. Uh, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Thank you. It's uh, Florence Hello for Professor Tamke. Do you know um, by your, do you know? <laughs> do you know by which way or from what place Monet was brought to Umia for the orphanage? From to Delgosha, by what way or from what place? Yes. Now, now it was. The only mark I gave also in my presentation is uh, that we heard 
they came over the mountains up to now, but I'm not sure what we will find in the next three years when uh, the dissertation project is going on, because this is only in the official report. Uh, so I can't, uh, if your question is about the concrete way from Hakkari to Urmia, was it your question? Um, I only know that they are coming from over the border, that's given in the report, but I don't know w on which way they came. For the um, um, American and Russian relief committees, um, money came from Tiflis, from Caucasus, from Tiflis, or sometimes from Tabriz. And I, uh, I wonder if they were the same for, it was the same for uh, Dig uh, German, uh, German Dig Dig Sorry, I, I, I just, um, you mean many. Okay, uh, now I understand. Uh, we have not Tiflis uh, mentioned there. Later on, we see, for example, Yohanan uh, Pira, uh, he went to Tiflis, as a lot of them going as refugees uh, back to Europe later. Uh, but we have no account that the, for these uh, in the uh, orphanage in uh, the 1897, uh, when they opened uh, the orphanage, that they came that way. Because in the report, it's really given only that they came over the Persian border. So uh, I, I have the impression, and if you read the, the journals uh, when they were going to the Patriarch from that region, the people who were involved, you always have the direct way, not the way via Tiflis. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Yeah, my question is to Simon. So how come did you find to the statistics of the manuscript? So I know well that with HMML, with the that cataloging is, is not done yet, and we still really do have a lot of, of manuscripts that they should be worked on and, and cataloged. So I'm not sure if this is a work in progress, what you, you presented. It's an important idea to look for the colophons talking about the genocides. But you know well that there is a lot of work should be done in order to find the final conclusion for, for your paper. Yes, I would agree to that, um, but we have to uh, search for it. But uh, you mentioned um, Afrin Barson as a source, but um, other manuscripts are, didn't, um, are not digitalized. That is one problem. And the other problem is um, that uh, many manuscripts are also in private hands. And um, we can't say, it, is, it would be very um, important to see also this colophons and manuscripts. So it is a very hard way we have to go. But um, the, I think um, we find more information about the safe on Torah team when we um, go at this way. Thank you. My question is to Professor Bednarovic. Uh, in relation to the list I saw on your presentation, you mentioned Turks, Kurds, Jews, and others. Uh, I, you know, each time I see such such lists, I don't know. I'm just my question is, is there a political reason behind why those others do not have their own names? And other other question is, the thirty thousand you mentioned is an official number or is just? So these numbers were uh, based on the um, official Turkish statistics. So that is why, because I, I think that is why, because uh, there is no mention um, or, or appears the, the the term the others, because according to the Turkish law, uh, only three uh, minorities are recognized: the Jews, the Greek uh, Orthodoxes, and uh, the Armenians. So it probably th that is why uh, this is, was this was uh, it's 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 not it's not my uh, um, uh, calculation. So, Professor yeah. uh, it, it goes the, to the same direction. The question of linguistic genocide. I I do not agree with with uh, Tove uh, uh, saying that everything 
uh, every linguistic policy is linguistic genocide. We have to differentiate. I think uh, a linguistic genocide by, by uh, committing a genocide against the people is something else, or killing all the speakers is something else than prohibiting people to learn their language over centuries. Uh, so to put these two or three categories into the same, under the same label, um, we somehow lose the importance of the linguistic genocide in our case. In our case, what you mentioned, linguistic genocide uh, through the prohibiting of the language, this is a commitment which went on from the starting, from the starting of the Republic, establishment of the Republic until almost today. Nowadays, they, uh, there are changes in the Turkish policies towards minorities, but linguistic genocide by really a genocide, killing all the speakers, is what we heard yesterday from Professor Yastro when he, he uh, talked about uh, his experience to, uh, uh, by accident, coming across people, uh, survivors, one person, two person, from a whole, whole language co community. This is a linguistic genocide. And not, or at least, uh, otherwise we would have to find another word for, for this linguistic genocide. I think we should be very, very careful in, this, in these things. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Tove Skutabian, um, he knows that um, this term could be uh, perceived by some as too strong, and he um, she uh, wrote it in, in his book. Uh, but uh, she, she's, um, uh, she's sure that it, it should be used. Just, just this word, the, the linguicide, as the most proper. Um, you know, in my research, and I don't remember where I found it, but in my research I came across one um, document that said that the patriarch of the Armenians was also in charge of the Assyrians. And so I'm wondering if this, if this was true, then I'm wondering if this is uh, why there was no mention of the Assyrians, as, and maybe they're included in the Armenians, or whether they're um, just part of the other in, your, in the um, census. Yes, I, I know this information that... Uh, Does this, did, was this true, that he, the patriarch of the Armenians was... was uh, some sources uh, mention about this, oh. that... Uh, I think after the war, that's no longer the case. Before the war, yes, and then even it's very complicated. Before the war, sometimes the Armenian patriarch takes account of the others, but sometimes the, the Assyrian Patriarch goes directly to Istanbul to, to uh, plead for his case. So it's a very complicated system, and I'm sure it's no longer in place after the war. So then it's really different. There's different choices that were made by the Syrian Orthodox. And, well, there were almost no Church of the East people left, so that they, they did not have that kind of advocacy um, in, in the negotiation. So that's a, a really a different situation after the war. Own militias, uh, in own status of a millet. So, so even before the war, there was already a change between the relationship of the Armenians. When the Armenian Patriarchate was installed by the conqueror, in the beginning, it was clear they were uh, responsible for all Oriental Orthodox churches. But this changed dramatically in the 18th and 19th century. And in the end of the 19th century, it's clear that the Syrian Orthodox was a millet of its own. So it managed the things themselves. You can see it in the reports and travels of Petros to uh, Istanbul. So he always has to uh, travel to Istanbul to, to clarify uh, the ongoing things there. Just. Thank you. Um, if I may say a short word about language death. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't uh, hear the presentation, uh, but uh, according to what, no, it's a, general, it's, a, it's a general idea. You have to distinguish between different types of language death and there is what we are talking about here is language death caused by speaker death. You know, if you kill all the speakers, then the language is dead. There is a different type uh, of language death which is uh, by, brought about by governments uh, who try to suppress a language. 
not necessarily by killing the speakers. This is practiced in Turkey for, for non-Christian languages like Laz language, Kurdish language. And it's also practiced by chauvinist governments like in France, where there were a number of native languages which were practically exterminated, like the Breton, Breton language Breton, which had, which had hundreds of thousands of speakers and is now practically is dying out. And there are other cases of languages dying out by themselves and cannot be, and, and cannot be salvaged even by efforts of the government. And this is the case, for instance, in Ireland. Irish is a language which is dying out inevitably, although the Irish government makes every effort to, to keep it alive. They even pay a certain uh, kind of salary to everybody who still speaks the language, but it, <laughs> it doesn't help. It's dying out. Thank you. <clears throat> Just, just a quick comment. The, um, the Suryani, so um, the Syriac Orthodox were recognized as a distinct millet from the Armenians in the 1870s. Um, the Syriac Catholics were attached to the Armenian Catholic millet, um, and they also were separated, I think, in the 1880s. And likewise, the Chaldeans were recognized as a distinct Ottoman millet in the 1880s, um, separating from the Armenian Catholics. Sam, thank you very much for an excellent paper. I have a question about the two poems by Galo Shabo. Um, lately, I have looked into the, his shorter poem that I didn't know about earlier, and I found the language um, very different from his first poem and much longer poem. And... Um, so I, I started asking myself, is, is the second one ascribed to him? Is it written by someone else? Because the language is, is more difficult. And, and uh, uh, Nicholas has translated it for me in, in, into English. So he, he has looked at it with more detail than I, I have done. Can you say something about it? Oh, it's very hard. It is very hard to say if uh, the second poem is um, written by Galushabo because you said it, the intention is uh, the uh, is uh, another one. Um, maybe from the style, I would say it can be written by. It can be say. It can be said that it is written by uh, Galushabo, but um, I. Th but. Um, I would say also that is this um, possible that he. Um, wrote a poem which is very different from the first poem because uh, the uh, the context has changed. So in, in his first poem, um, he used a very apocalyptic view of the things of the Sefo. I think it is written very close to the Sefo because he said also that um, we are still in a very bad situation and in the second poem, it is um, maybe written when he goes to Syria and the situation became um, better for him. So I would say it is possible, but uh, we, can't, we cannot say it with um, security because we have only this, these two poems by him. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention.